you are listening to the Necropolis Podcast, which is brought to you by Jason from Goatcraft and Shelly from HateMeditations.com and Metal Lesion Magazine. Hello, welcome to Necropolis. I am Shelly of the um, online metal blog, Hate Meditations. If you like armchair rhetoric on extreme metal, check Hate Meditations out. And we're joined, as ever, by uh, Jason. Hello, Jason. Hello, hello. Another uh, English episode, two Englishmen. So I got to sift through the accents here to actually parse what you're saying. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to this. have a uh, interesting guy on here, and I'm looking forward to actually picking his brain a little bit to see uh, what he's all about. So thank you. I will try and speak in the Queen's English with a perfect enunciation so that you can uh, understand what I'm saying, Jason. But yes, we are joined by Nathaniel of the uh, UK death metal band, Uh Good to have you on, Nathaniel. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me and having me on this show. I will also endeavour to enunciate in RP, BBC English, the Queen's English, whatever you want to call it, uh, for clarity, etc. Yes, can you, um, also, can you also use the Oxford commas when you're speaking? <laughs> I, I, I suppose we can try and imply them, but, uh, but yes, punctuation is, uh, is, is difficult to truly... Uh, put across in uh, in in simple verbal uh, speech. On a uh, related topic, um, I have never actually heard your band name pronounced out loud. I'm pronouncing it right, aren't I? Da- damn him. Close enough. Okay. Um, so just to put it in context, yes, I did come across damn him in around 2020, just randomly scrolling through. Um, metal online and um i kind of assumed that you were part of like a newer wave of like uk based death metal that um has kind of been happening in recent years with bands like uh, cryptic shift and things like that but obviously in uh, looking into you guys i didn't realize that you've been um going at this for quite some time since the 90s in fact um so i wonder if you could just give us like a, a quick like potted history because i understand you've gone through several sort of lineups and incarnations over the years um but you've sort of remained the uh the fixed member in all that time so my first uh, reaction to that is bloody hell um if you want to <laughs> sorry history, um that's going that might take a while so I'll, I'll i'll try to be as brief and avoid the pedantry as much as possible uh no guarantees of course but i guess we started out as a as a as a it was just me and a drummer who wanted to make music and that was our first gig at this venue called the red eye uh which some of you may or may not have heard of so bearing in mind this was the late 90s which as far as i'm concerned was uh a very much a nadir for heavy music right you had new metal and you had bar house and you had maybe indie insipid pop rock those ruled the 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 waves the airwaves whatever you want to, to call it and there was nothing you could be into that was less appealing in sort of mainstream social terms than death and thrash and black metal right and it was just awful and i just moved to london um in search part well partly to study but partly in search for um uh, of uh, a, more of a scene and and actually I came from somewhere where there was pretty much nothing I used to live in Brussels before I lived in London and finding the red eye with its faithful 40 odd you know drunken metal heads all head banging to the same to, to whatever band came and played at that time was just such a revelation and like the, the, to discover that there were unknown bands that were actually really good that was a revelation and then you know there was the frustration of going to the the cannibal corpse show and seeing you know five six hundred people and then coming coming to the the the, the show afterwards having to do some, some sort of 
dodgy rock club and to see that it was only that kind of horror of underground diehards that would turn up but this this red eye is where i saw the first ever akakoka show uh which again was a real revelation it was like i can't believe how good this band is and the, you know the song stuck in my head for a while so uh anyway we started out around that time and it sort of morphed and i think the the first shall we say um convincing incarnation was when we signed to candle up first couple of albums and this was with jaime uh, jaime gomez on drums who is a fantastic drummer and helped to kind of propel the sound to a new uh, a, a new identity especially with his fluidity and his aptness in terms of uh using uh, what, what's called a a skank beat or a two four, the sort of the classic thrash slayer beat, but you know, applying it to in places I wouldn't necessarily expect it, and and kind of using blast beats and and all sorts of stuff, and that dynamic, that axis of drum beats and riffs, and and the sort of the composition that naturally fro- flows from that, that's always been at the core of of this band, and so you know, we we kind of did did, did a couple of albums. And then there was a bit of a lull, which was just a difficulty in finding a lineup where we could really uh, come into our own and and compose in in the same way as before, right? Having somebody with whom you can have that musical chemistry. So eventually, I came across uh, Flo Toolman, who's this uh, the chap who we're working with right now, and eventually we. The, the lineup had changed so much, number one. And number two, um, it just became a losing battle with the, with the name. So we used to be called Dam, uh, which means blood in, in Hebrew and as it happens, Arabic as well. And, um, and yes, if, if you have any, um, any name, any word, which is just constituted of three alphanumeric characters, in terms of getting it identified, unless you're a sort of universal brand, it's a losing battle. So by the time we decided to change the name, there was a, a I, I don't know exactly the, the sort of the full range of it, but we had a Brazilian power metal band, an Ecuadorian Christian death metal band, a um, some sort of symphonic metal band. Obviously, you had DAM, the uh, UK thrash band, Destruction and Mayhem. You had a Palestinian hip hop band. You had people having flame wars on Last Dot FM, and it was time to cut our losses. So instead of completely changing it, we changed it to Damim, which means uh, a sort of bloodshed or payment in blood, or depends on the exact interpretation of the word. But it's 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 an extension of the original name, and it uses a similar or the same font to to achieve a similar identity, shall we say? But by that time, we had flow uh faust on bass ed on guitar and obviously myself on guitar and vocals and faust by the way that's his real birth name uh on his passport uh it's not a pseudonym uh he's not norwegian he's uh, (laughs) uh, uh, american slash south american he he grew up in miami and Colombia. uh but uh but yes so that's that's that and then uh ed left a couple of years ago just as we went into just as we were about to get into the pandemic we had nick join uh nick who plays guitar and is a um whittling whittle wizard uh he's great with solos and as as well as rhythm obviously and he's just recently joined uh, benediction on bass as well so um and that was so that was the 20 which was shortly after the release of our third album which was called a fine game of nil and obviously right now well i say obviously a lot uh, obviously to me i'm not assuming it's obviously to any of your uh, listeners or yourselves uh, we're about to release our uh, next release which is an ep on a label called church road records which is the same label that voices are on at the moment and a a host of other interesting bands in, including celestial sanctuary if you're talking about uh, a new wave of british death metal or whatever it's called 
So yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm familiar with them. Um, you actually did anticipate my next question. So World Turns Hell is the, the name of the new EP, correct? That's the one. That's the one, yeah. And um, yeah, so just to talk a little bit about the, the music, because um, yeah, Fine Game of Nil came out in 2019. And um, it's this interesting concoction of of styles where i hesitate to even kind of brand it with a tag but there yeah there's elements of like technical death metal and technical thrash but there's also elements of sort of industrial and gothic doom in there as well um it's this kind of this loose miasma of different influences going on but it all comes together into sort of quite an interesting like tight package i guess and yeah world, world turn hell kind of yeah it just it sort of reaffirms that as well I, I was giving that a listen earlier on and yeah it sort of continues this this kind of weird little <laughs> weird little niche that you seem to have carved out within uh, uk death metal so um i I'm, I'm assuming from the gap that you want me to intervene so firstly have you heard the difference Andrew, which is our prior album which was released in 2007 now which is 16 years ago, nearly. I so was listening to uh, The Difference Engine earlier today, yes, yeah. Okay, so uh, the, the reason being, I would say that, that is, I mean, even, even Purity, uh, The Darwinian Paradox, which was the first album, which was, had this, adopted this sort of approach in a way, but I would say that it wasn't as as refined, concise, focused, etc., And I would say that we really hit our stride with the different engine. If you listen to that, that that kind of quite warm, low mid, low mid sort of guitar sound with, you know, it's, it's, um, it's simultaneously incandescent and distinctive enough to be precise in terms of, you know, you can hear the riffing um with with these really complex things that i came up with at the time and it's for me that was the, the first album where we where we kind of for lack of a better way of putting it chanced upon this formula without it being formulaic this formula of a, of a process almost rather than a, an intended end result again if you listen to that album there's black metal in there there's death metal definitely there's there's even some doom. There's there's definitely lots of thrash, and and there's a kind of gothic edge to it. I would say you know again it's it's dif- difficult to really be objective uh, as somebody who's who's you know intimately uh, involved in in the, the the creative process. But I think that that sort of formula is there in one way or another, and. At the same time, every with every not even with every album, but with every new song, new piece of music that we would create, there's, there's an element of, well, we're going to lean on the things that we've done before, but let's try and add this kind of flavor and this thread to it. And so you never really end up with two songs that are exactly along the same lines. It's more of a you know, you, you start and you trust your taste and you kind of combine these riffs, some of them which may have been uh, kicking around your brain for literally years and years and years. Some of them might be very recent uh, additions and you just can't stop playing them. And then you'll have the, the immediacy of the kind of chemistry that you can only get in a rehearsal room with, you know, with real musicians and with that kind of bouncing the ideas around and like, combining them that synergy and once you get those elements together you can almost kind of carve your way through the song um, building this 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 uh, sculpture out of these different kind of uh, segments and and assemblages into this uh, this final work and then when you come out of it the other side you're not really quite sure how you manage to do it at all you've no idea how you're going to to, to even think about uh, uh, the next one that you're going to do. You, you really, at least for me, the experience is very much like, how on earth did I come up with this? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea how I'm going to do it again. But I'm certainly going to try, and I'm going to trust my taste, my intuition, my my sensibility uh, in terms of of, uh, of of this cathartic 
existential racket. <laughs> yeah, you can, now that you sort of put it like that, you, like you can definitely see it being worked out as you're listening. You can sort of, okay, right, there's a, there's a riff that sounds reminiscent of Morbid Angel. Um, there's like a vocal line where you, you obviously incorporate a lot of um, clean singing in between the distorted tone, but also your distorted tone is, is quite varied. Like you touch on like the black metal style and death metal and some thrash as well as working in like clean passages. Um, that's sort of where the, the, where I sort of mentioned the goth influence as well. Mm -hmm. um but you can you yeah now that you sort of articulate it like that you can see these different things sort of flowing together to create this is going to sound very cliche apologies but sort of create something new from these different fragments um on top of on top of the old which is quite an, it's an interesting process because you don't often see that with a lot of bands they either have a very obvious like handful of bands that they're influenced by and they're just trying to imitate them or they go in the other direction and try and be completely off the wall and completely avant-garde but Damien is still it feels like very much of the imaginative death metal like um wave that's going on but it very very much has its own like, distinct little niche carved out that I don't think many other death metal bands are, are toying with at the moment can I chime in real quick um so something I've been listening to Damon for a, a few days now um, since you're coming on the, the podcast here and uh, something that I've always kind of thought about, you know, extreme metal back in like the mid nineties was there was this big emphasis on combining you know, death and black metal together because, you know, death metal became really big and then uh, black metal followed and became even bigger to an extent and uh, the logical conclusion after that was kind of to combine the forms, which happened with a lot of different bands. And then all of a sudden you have like death metal bands riffing um, the style of black metal here or there and uh, vice versa. And you have like complete hybrids of the two. Um, and I, uh, with, the, uh, with that happening in the 90s, um, back in the early 2000s, there was like this great mishmash of a lot of different projects pulling in a lot of different influences to just kind of carve out their own niche, quote unquote. And uh, that is what Shelly and I typically observe as like the, the confused point of extreme metal was when uh, there was a lot of different influences going all over the place. And it was really kind of hard to latch on to like a specific identity in some of the bands but what I what I experienced listening to Damon um, was that you know yes the uh, the album the Difference Engine has some of that where there are a lot of different influences that are in the music and it's kind of hint, hard to pinpoint the exact uh, identity of the project but it, it's way less offensive than a lot <laughs> of the other projects that. Um, and you just get this mishmash of random ideas. So there, there actually seems like there's a lot of forethought in how the the presentation is. And although it may not, you know, your song may have like elements of different subgenres of extreme metal. Um, it's presented in such a way that um, it makes sense, um, rather than just being like riff salad of a lot of different styles and i actually i i listened to uh the game a fine game of not no um which came out uh, back in 2019 and i feel like this one is even stronger than the the 2000s albums where um it's you you draw on a lot of different influences but the way it's presented isn't offensive like it, it was with a lot of other projects like uh I can name one off the like dissenter with uh, two S's. Um, they had a lot of potential too, but uh, eventually they just had like too many random influences that really held them back where they didn't have their own identity. But I feel like the way that you're able to present the material and damn them is a lot more thoughtful. So I wanted to chime in um, on that um, and perhaps have your opinion. Cause you know, Akrakok, the band that you mentioned also has uh a wide array of influences um 
and they're able to present it kind of like I would say they're a little bit more poppy um, than, uh, you know, like the the guts and blood of like, you know, the real like nitty gritty of extreme metal. But um, I actually view your project Tamim is actually better than Hacker Clock, honestly, because uh, there are some aspects that I do view as offensive from them. Whereas I don't view your music as being offensive. That makes sense, Nathaniel. Sorry, I was uh, I muted myself just to make sure I uh, didn't contaminate the recording with any noise. <clears throat> uh, although I probably failed at that by now. But um, essentially, um, I mean, I can. So, like I said, I, I actually witnessed the very first Akagoka uh, show and so I've always been a fan I You've really like them, them haven't you? I, well I used to <laughs> I used to play bass for them, yes yeah. there's the, uh, we, can, we can go through the uh, uh, the Akagoka reunion story as well if you want at some point <laughs> but um, um, in terms of, of their music like I do feel that some of their let's say the different parts that they uh, that they combine times are a little bit um, the changes can be a bit sudden right so it can feel a little bit like well this is a bit this is strange this is not expected etc and I, I do feel that we may be or put more en emphasis and, and energy and effort into um, the, the kind of the, the intermeshing, the interweaving of the different influences, and it, it's it's sort of it it's more like working in shades, and you know you shade and you add another uh, another layer, and you 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 know you kind of combine things that way rather than hey I've got this riff that sounds like you know this kind of world of 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 musical interest, and then we've got this other part, and it's play one after the other, and one thing that, that I think they've they've always said is if you play with enough conviction it'll and belief it'll work. You can absolutely make it work. And I do think that most of the time it works, but sometimes you know you have the sort of black metal part and then the, the kind of the drum and bass part. And the, the change can be a bit sudden and jarring, at least if you're not used to the to the to the, the the song, the material, the change, etc. But I've, you know, I've I have a lot of time, and obviously I'm I'm very much into the band. Um, so yes, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, it's it's something that I'm always looking for in. Um, so on on my Kate meditations, I I review a lot of new music, or I, I try to, and it's it's something I'm always looking for is is metal that is imaginative enough and original enough. But is still is not sort of completely off the wall to the point where it's trying too hard to break with uh, tradition. And I realise that can be a very subjective um, response um, to a lot of it. But yeah, I think yeah, it, it's a tough line to walk. But I think yeah, the Damon is kind of is walking that line, um, and yeah, that does make them one of the more interesting like artifacts of uh, British death metal um, at the moment. Um, I just wonder if we could turn to, I wanted to talk about like the aesthetic of the band as well, because your album artwork and your band logo, they're not sort of typical of, of death metal in, in the, um, the uh, band logo is very much sort of um, very clear. <laughs> it's legible. Um, and the the artwork is um, is not sort of the typical um, either sort of paintings of uh, sort of sci-fi or Lovecraftian horror or um, you know just straight up gore or whatever. I um, I understand sort of you in was it the first lockdown uh, started to produce like a, a comic book accompaniment to some of the sort of lyrical themes that you unpack that also kind of influences is sort of tied into the the artwork of of the releases and especially your new EP, um, World Turned Hell. So um, as far as how much the comic is tied into the, the aesthetic, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say that that's so much the case, right? We have, 
the, the, the comic started during lockdown as, as, as something else to invest our creative energy into, right? Um, we, we, well, we couldn't make music collaboratively. So we, we got together with the artists who did some of the artwork that featured in the inlay of a fine game of nil. And we, uh, we, we brought to life this idea of a comic depicting, you know, a band running through the streets of London, uh, fighting the forces of evil with the power of gu loud guitars, fast drums, and the, uh, the occult forces, uh, thus unleashed, right? So it was, it's, it's more of a, uh, I don't want to call it whimsical, but it's, uh, it's definitely less, uh, less of a kind of po-faced existential catharsis uh, venture uh, that there isn't so much those themes. It's more about the, the kind of exploring a different avenue of creativity. And obviously there's a connection, you know, the, 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 the typography of the logo is the same. Obviously we're character in the, in the comic um, and so on. But, um, but it's, it's, Thematically, I wouldn't say connected. Now, when it comes to the aesthetic of the band itself, I think at the beginning, especially, I was almost bloody-minded in terms of eschewing the 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 the, the, the traditional uh, kind of almost dichotomy of you know you had to uh, you had to choose badger paint or gore kind of thing. Almost, <laughs> it was it was almost that, and. And we, we wanted nothing to do with either, like, especially uh, Corpse Paint or, you know, its successes such as, you know, Cloaks or Hoods or, or what's, what's the other one? Sigil painted uh, face masks or whatever it is, right? That's the, the, the theatricality, I think, takes away from the purity of the art that you're delivering, right? And I think this this um, deliberately idiosyncratic um, approach did put some people off who would have been, who would have been into uh, our, our, our mix of influences. Like if they'd listened to nothing with the music, they might have thought actually this is great. But a lot of the, the or a number of people kind of, I think in retrospect took offense to that. But frankly, it's it's just it's just part of of what we are right and you're always going to get people who don't like the cut of your jib and i would even say go as far as saying that if you don't end up having strong reactions including negative ones to what you're doing then you're probably doing something wrong right you, you just like i'm not interested in going well as as much as i I love death metal, right? If we like, especially something like Gore Guts, considered dead, is one of my absolute favorite albums, you know, hands down, right? Uh, but I, I, I've no interest in going. Well, let's let's try and remake this sound and see if we can fit into this scene of bands that are doing something ostensibly similar, you know, with with this particular flavor of twist, like that's that there's absolutely no point in that uh, to me personally. So um, there's also the fact that our logo is actually legible on posters. And in terms of the proportions, you kind of get a bit more bang for your buck because you can read it further away from further away than, than the, the other bands, at least you tend to. Um, but uh, but yeah, the, in, and in terms of the artwork, it's, I don't know. Again, thematically, if you just re-examine the, the the types of subjects that were examined by other bands, you you fall into cliche very quickly, right? And it's it's um, we're we're venturing into to lyrical territory almost here because if you think about what was what was what made some a band like Carcass remarkable when they they came up with week of putrefaction etc is nobody had really explored that topic in that way to try and get you know 
uh, push the envelope of, of of how shocking you could make the subject matter in that particular dimension, shall we say? And and that's 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 great. That's what they did. They did it really well. At least that part of it. Uh, um, but um, but you you know you it it just gets it becomes a parody of what you're trying to do if you just plow that furrow and you go through the same phase and you you just reuse almost lyrics that other people have have uh, come up with and same thing if you're if you're talking about the the types of subjects espoused by you know satanic black metal etc it's not that i have really had any interest in the, the either of those uh topics actually personally but there's there's plenty of um raw material for inspiration just look around you we live in a in a disturbing world right i mean it's 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 incredible and 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 wonderful but also really messed up and terrifying and and pretty much anywhere you look there's there's a completely novel shocking thing to explore if that's what you want to to do there's also the fact that uh, I think, and this this works across every aesthetic. If you so have something that's just a a kind of uh, a, a nice note, right? Um, and I'm kind of digressing a bit, but think about think about flavors or scents, right? If you have just kind of um, it's it's a fairly well known fact that if you just have like nice tones to your to the scent that you're that you're trying to create, right? You, you're just going to end up with something really, really boring. And if you add a touch of something musky or like with with a kind of more pungent, uh, animalic note, right? Like if you know anything about organic chemistry, I guess uh, it, it's a sort of um, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, you that's the only way to get something that's truly interesting and it's the same thing i suppose the other way around with every metal if you just have like something that's ugly or or just always has the same notes always symmetrical it's going to be boring it's going to be predictable you need something to break the symmetry whether it's musically lyrically aesthetically etc cetera, etc cetera. And you need to do it in a way that's ostensibly at least somewhat different, at least somewhat interesting, at least breaking new ground in one way, even if it's breaking new ground with regards to your existing body of work. Right. And um, that was a hell of a tangent. Yeah, I, I do have a question for you. Um, about two or three <laughs> minutes ago, you did mention that, um, that the world is terrifying and also fascinating. Um, which I, I view that as a complete existential statement um, that you're placing your own ontological being into this uh, uncertain, uncertain world where you know it, it, it can uh, heighten your being or destroy it. So, do you view that existentialism is a uh, key ingredient of your music? Um, if you describe it that way, then I suppose in some ways it's, it's almost at the foundation of of what we're doing, a sort of cathartic, therapeutic um, process that allows us to um, firstly better understand then, uh, what, you know, our, our place in the world. Secondly, um, I guess better better accept it, better process it. And, and yes, so, yeah, the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, yeah, we've yeah, had it, quite a few debates about existentialism versus determinism on this, yeah, especially with David Burke, who is also an Englishman, and he's an academic um, specializing in uh, extreme metal studies. So I'm um, going for his PhD in it, actually. So, just kind of interesting to get your take on that since uh, you're kind of seem to be in the same vein as him a little bit. 
Um, but uh, he views metal as being inherently uh, existential and that uh, there's an inherent loss in extreme metal. Um, like there's this element of just sheer loss um, that is uh, communicated through extreme metal. So I was wondering what your thoughts were um, in regard to your music being existential. So go ahead, Shelley. Uh, I was I was going to talk about something much more trivial. Um, <laughs> Just um, going back to like the the aesthetic or rather you know, the, the con concepts and the themes, because uh, like since around the mid 2000s, the themes that like extreme metal delves into has exploded. It's not just sort of gore, Satan or fear of nuclear annihilation. It, it's exploded into all manner of like theology and philosophy and um, esoteric kind of subjects. But it's interesting to hear you talk about the the choices behind like the aesthetic because on the one hand as like thoughtful quote unquote listeners we like to think of ourselves as above such things and we'll only judge the music on its own account and um like blah 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 we're not really interested in appearances but on the other hand do judge a book by its cover all the time and i kind of think well that album's going to sound like this because it has this cover and it's interesting how bands so often play into that as well they kind of you know, there's still like bands that will release what I call, you know, vampiric black metal, whatever, where it's just the the grainy corpse paint photo that just looks like Transylvanian hunger rule, or they'll release the Lovecraftian death metal album. And it it's, you know, it's always a striking kind of image, but it's very neatly into a, like a particular tradition. And then if the reason I wanted to sort of draw that out a little bit is because with Damien, it's like, if I was to judge the book by its cover, I would have assumed, oh, well, that's going to be some sort of industrial or electronic album. And then you put it on and it's this um, kind of interesting, like mix of different elements of extreme metal and so on. Um, so, yeah, that was just the, the reason that I wanted to uh, unpick that because it, it does go against the grain um, to a lot, to, in a, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, as you said, you don't need to uh, print your name under the, uh, under the logo on gig posters and so on. <laughs> Um, I, I would also add, in terms of the uh, the lyrics, um, like one of the things that I try to do, which I think, um, I well, which I don't think is necessarily as widespread as it could be in terms of lyric writing, and um, I, I I might add. A sort of a bit of a plug here uh, I suppose which is uh, the fact that I I was I, I wrote the the lyrics and the, the 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 meat and potatoes of the vocal patterns for the latest album for this French death metal band Loud Blast I don't know if you've heard them um, but I would recommend their latest album Manifesto and uh, we're currently working on the lyrics for the next one as well and I also contributed uh, a number of lyrics for uh, this um, band called Sinsanium, which is a, which was, which is a band with um, Fred from, who plays bass and creator. And it, it there's um, uh, Steph from Loud Blast. And there was Jerry Jordison on drums on the first album. And now they have a new drummer, etc. But, that I'm not sure what's, what the status is for the, that particular release, but it's going to come out at some point in the not too distant future. But what I try to do in lyrics, not always, but I, I do try to tie it to almost like the minutia of life, like some sort of situation that causes you to, to juxtapose certain concepts and thoughts in a way that is in some way remarkable right and if you have that kind of tying that to the, the detail that can really bring the concept that you're trying to put across into focus in a way that broad generic terms that you'll have you know read about in a book or whatever could couldn't hope to do right and i think that's something that um uh that that, that really informs the aesthetic uh, to, for the sake of tying it back to the discussion that we're having rather than me 
uh, going on simply about how I write lyrics. But it, it, it really, again, there's there's almost an idiosyncratic approach to the the lyric writing in terms of I'm not going to just go round down that that route of 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 like um, necessarily violent lyrics, although there is violent you know imagery and and whatnot but like if you add a personal dimension in a way it makes it more real it makes it more immediate and relatable and in some way uh i I suppose more likely to provoke the kinds of mini epiphanies that you'll have when you read um i i guess or you you come across lyrics or writing that you appreciate that you can connect to does that does that make sense uh, it makes it makes sense and I, th- I think it is borne out because like i mentioned earlier like you you do throw in like clean vocals or distorted vocals where the lyrics are very like present very audible which obviously isn't always the case in extreme metal and like that that kind of really helps that affect because for me i often don't pay attention to the lyrics um unless I get very interested in the band. But yeah, when when you can actually hear them and they do sort of add to the impact of a particular moment or a particular passage, then yeah, that that kind of really kind of heightens the um the impact of that. Um so I had I had a couple more questions um before we move on. Um one is again maybe a rather trivial one, but we have we have sort of mentioned influence and um the kind of the things that Damim draws on um, to sort of carve out the niche that it does. But um, yeah, what are your, what are some of your sort of, what would you say kind of key influences both within metal and maybe outside of, of metal as well? What are your top five favorite brands, bands even? Um, <laughs> well, uh, you might I, as well say brands. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question, but also an easy question. Um, but I can I can throw in a, a few names, shall we say? Um, well, not not just favorite bands, but particular influences on your sound, which might not necessarily be the same thing, but they might well be. No, that's fair. Um, so you might hear certain touches of death, uh, Carcass, Emperor, early Sepultura, Max Youth only. <laughs> <laughs> um, some, there's bits of Exodus, uh, Overkill. I think there's more touches of that that uh, that came through on a fine game of nil, but uh, but not necessarily, you know, in the riffing that sort of thing. Um, definitely more and more killing jokes seeping in uh, progressively. Although there's, you know, it's obviously. If if the the band heard it, they'd go, "What? How how is this in any way, shape, or form influenced by what we did?" But uh, there's there's definitely aspects of the sound, as in the guitar sound, or the, the touches of some of the riffing, or some of the singing, some of the kind of vocal textures that that I've explored. Um, there's um, Definitely some Godflesh in there. I don't know if you're a fan, but, uh, but I am. I've, there's, yeah. there's something about that kind of when they really hit their stride about about the the sound, the repetition, the vibe. This it, and it's it's one of those bands that have just reinvented themselves practically with every album, and just become you know re re delivered something vital important and like and nobody else is making you know i haven't to be fair i haven't heard the very latest album but that's how i felt about those two comeback albums which i was uh, was very very pleased existed and and they're brilliant live and that bass sound goodness yes, me, that yeah. bass sound um so there's that, that's that's a good few i suppose miss sugar always uh even if that's not necessarily obvious I've heard people describe Meshuggah as cold and, you know, lacking atmosphere, and I'd have to, you know, hard disagree with that. I think it's fantastically atmospheric and evocative band. If you don't get that, I feel, I feel sorry for you. I genuinely do. Um, 
but but you know the, the one of the things that we always try to put across in our music is the, the musicality or the, the the evocation before any kind of technicality or any of those aspects it's about it's not about virtuosity although there is i suppose some some aspect of that in there although i'm not going to pretend for a, for a moment that you know I, there, there, there are plenty of musicians who are better than any of us right but uh but at the same time it's the focus is always the the kind of the the moment that the the, the noise that the gestalt can produce that no other kind of group of humans can make with with instruments right so um so yes um coming back to the actual influences i I suppose that's a good handful. You know, you've got black metal, thrash metal, death metal. Oh, suffocation. There's definitely a bit of stuff in yeah. there. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that gives you an overview. Go on. Oh, yeah. No, like you can definitely hear the, I mean, the sort of the quote unquote tech death side, the gorbets and the suffocation almost goes without saying. But I would also, yeah, just to reiterate, like Killing Joke and Godflesh are two of my all-time oh, no, favourite. No, no. can, can I stop you a minute? One, one second. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hi. Really sorry about that. That was that was surreal. Um, this uh, this chap, Tim, who used to play in Gorotted, um, when uh, well, just he used to play in Gorotted. So he was he was on the same tour bus as us in two thousand and five spent like four weeks on a tour bus with him going around Europe with decapitated. Uh, and he just walked past. I, I had no idea he was in Bristol. So that oh, was, okay. I had, yeah, I had, I had, I'm sorry. I had to stop and uh, say, um, just, um, yeah, say hello to him. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll try not to keep it too much longer, but. Um, were they in the band no, that released no, 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 uh, no. Only Tools and Corpses? That's the one. Yes. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> That's, you know, early two thousand stuff. Cool. But anyway, uh, yeah, I'll edit out all of this stuff um, of the disruption. Apologies for the interruption. Yeah, the, the, I, I just had to. Yeah. No, that's fine. No worries. No worries. Um, so yeah, all, all I was going to chime in with is just to say, like, um, yeah, obviously the 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 suffocation, the gorgots, and the, the technical side of death metal. That kind of almost goes without saying, but the yeah, Godflesh and Killing Joker, probably two of my all-time favorite artists, and I agree that they kind of lend a because the industrial element to it, they kind of lend a bleakness and a kind of urban despondency to their music that um, you can definitely kind of hear that thread in in Damien as well, which you don't often really get in death metal because death metal is is very it's either very dense and very kind of music or it's or it's too complex to kind of really articulate that that sense of emptiness that um that godflesh were kind of tapping into um so yeah it, it is interesting that that thread that i think yeah maybe maybe more bands should explore but um i know that jason wanted to uh chime in with a question so i'll just uh, hand over to him so the uh the name of the band Damon is uh hebrew um, also, on your last album, A Fine Game of Nil, there is a, a, a track called Descendant of Amalek, um, which were the enemies of the uh, Israelites. Um, I did uh, I had to study the Old Bible, Old Testament uh, in the college because I went to a private Christian university. I was just wondering if that is also a prominent theme in your music to uh, have like old testament uh references um whether you know I, honestly I, I view your your music as a bit essential but if you look at the old testament you know there's the deterministic aspects of god where he's constantly punishing the israelites over and over and over again um so can you talk a little bit about the uh, the old testament influences in your music before we move on to the next subject um, well, actually, one of the uh, one of our songs off the first album called "No God with Me" has a has an Old Testament quote, and I the title comes from the Old Testament quote, and it's not uh, it it was it I I took it because it was so incongruous that there would be that sort of 
wording or line in it, right? Um, but it's not, uh, how, how do I put it? Um, I wouldn't say it's either deterministic or reverential or, or, or anything like that, but it's, it's part of the kind of the fabric of the collective unconscious. So it's almost inevitable that something like that is going to seep into to, 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 to any, um, I, well, it, it is my, I should preamble this with, it is my opinion that it is inevitable that if you're going to make any kind of uh, exploration of, of, of existence, at least in our, uh, understanding of it in in this at the, this particular moment in time, you're going to drop some sort of reference to the the the, the this kind of uh, uh, religious or um, the, the the tapestry of stuff that that underpins, I suppose, Western society in a way, right? I would expect. Um, other bands to bring in their their own kind of uh, uh, references. So, I mean, for example, I've been listening to Dead Congregation, Grave of the Archangels. You know, you have this mournful, uh, orthodox singing that that intersperses some of the songs to to great effect. Um, and I would imagine uh, you have the same sort of vibe with, although I, I never really. Uh, given them much uh, attention, not that I, I have anything against them or anything, but Batushka kind of bringing that sort of thing. But yeah, I've I've lost the focus of the answer to your question. Um, yeah. Okay, Shelley. Um, do you want to move on to? Uh, I know you're really, really interested in bringing up a specific subject. Uh, well, no, <laughs> no, it's just I have a confession to make. I don't often talk about my own band on the podcast, but um, I play in a band called Dawn of Elysium, who were the first band to play at the Manifest All Dea in back last year in Manchester that I believe you were headlining at. If I'm uh, was this a Sunday? Yes, it was, yes. Um, and we were due to play the um, the weekender that unfortunately got uh, cancelled at the very last minute due to the financial circumstances of the um, the organisers, which was um, a real game. But um, more broadly, I just wanted to get your take on sort of the state of the UK death metal scene in general, because at the start of the interview, you mentioned that the in the late 90s early 2000s when you first sort of started up there the the heavy music outlook was was quite bleak at the time um and you know you've obviously been in and out of the scene since then so you've kind of seen it um develop grow regress and you know all of the changes that it's been through since since that time um do you get a sense that like there is a a revival for UK death metal because the UK has never really been like a major capital in the same way that Sweden or Florida has um, in the history. Like we have our, you know, we have our well-known household names, your bolt throwers and your benedictions and your cancers and so on. But um, UK death metal has never had the same kind of currency as some other scenes. But I feel like at the moment um, there is, like a new wave of, of bands kind of making a splash. We've mentioned Cryptic Shift and Celestial Sanctuary. And unfortunately I was going to mention Live Burial as well, but they unfortunately just announced yeah. that they are throwing in that. the towel um, this week, which was a, a real shame. But there is like a, a cluster of bands that are kind of making things happen in the UK and are getting noticed. And I think, Damien, although you've been going for a lot longer than that, you do kind of slot quite nicely into that kind of scene of sort of UK death metal or imaginative uk bands is that is that the sense that you get as well uh new wave of old wave um so <laughs> um I, I mean we've we've always been plugging our our stuff in the uh, away in the background uh it's just taking a, people a fair amount of time to notice but we'd love that they're noticing nonetheless um in terms of the the state of heavy music 
it's it's a big question with many dimensions but the long and the short of it is i think we've never had it so good in a sense right um there's there's a huge potential for audience there's it's it's been familiarized right to 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 have like extreme music when i say extreme i mean mostly with extreme vocals routinely in things like films uh you know television media video games etc that was that was just out of the question right back back in the late 90s and whatnot so to have to to be in a, in a in a world where it's so widespread that there's you know that there are a lot more people whose ears have been accustomed to that kind of extremity means that you in a sense you have a much bigger opportunity in terms of the audience and you also have the the kind of the explosion of the 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 means of creating music right you have like the influx of cheap instruments the 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 availability of things like the, the means of musical production like software um you, again <laughs> my first demo uh, we we actually made with this is the band before right but we had two tape recorders and we had a mixing desk and we did like we recorded the drums guitars and guitars in one take and then we passed that through because we didn't have enough channels and then we did the bass and the vocals over double on that and it was noisy as hell but the energy was fantastic but it was it was you know his city shall we say um but to go from that to like where like a track was like wow professional oh my god you have eight tracks to this software that anybody can download put on their computer i'm thinking of something like audacity right it's basically open source uh software that allows you to multi-track pretty much anything um is is insane and that means you know there are all these other um all, all these other means of creating music available so you have this explosion of bands and you also have this elevation of the mean uh standard of competence so you know you have to have your uh your shit together for lack of a better way of putting it if you have if you are to stand any chance of doing anything meaningful right you need you need to have your own gear transport be you know reasonably professional in terms of your attitude uh think outside the box in terms of creating ways to kind of to connect with with your audience and what not and, and so th- there's yeah there's there's two sides to this the the other side i would say is the the fact that the explosion of the popularity of this type of music means that been diluted right and in some ways the gatekeepers are going to turn around and say ha i told you so like i remember i think it was in the early 2000s danny who's now in grave miasma uh was like saw saw one of our stickers somewhere on on the tube or something and he's like oh, i saw one of your stickers i don't think you should do that and i was like well i frankly i couldn't care less what you think <laughs> but he did, he his his point was i don't think it should be exposed to a wider audience i think you should still have to dig for that particular cultural currency right and if in a sense he was right because you have that that kind of the dilution of it you have all these let's say lower common denominator efforts subpar aesthetic uh output that's that's become i'd almost call it you know without wanting to completely uh besmirch their name the pantera effect right i mean they were they were an incredibly vibrant vital 
band that knocked everyone's socks off, right? There was that phenomenal tour they did with Megadeth where they blew Megadeth off stage every single night, right? And and then they exploded in popularity and and already at the time it was like you said Pantera and that meant the sort of um, baseball, reverse baseball cap wearing kind of uh, low brow uh, beer drinking kind of metal fan if you see what I mean and it, it just it almost took away from the 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 kind of the value of the music the the outstanding music like honestly that if if you deny the the contribution or the standard of Pantera's music you, you're just wrong right it was absolutely revolutionary at the time and it massively impacted pretty much every genre of metal subsequently right yeah, so you you almost have an effect like that because of the explosion of popularity of metal and you have it being bastardized and hybridized and you have people doing it artlessly shall we say who just who who do who make the kind of mu music uh ju musical juxtaposition that i think make you uncomfortable uh jason like uh and you know just have this heavy part with blast beats and then just have this, you know, major key sounding singy songy part without any rhyme of, or reason kind of thing. And, and these are not particularly complex or thoughtful things. And then you have the, the, the aesthetic seeping into things like the mainstream, right? Uh, where you have pop artists making references and all, all that sort of thing. So oh, I, 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 I can I, understand the gatekeeping. Go on. Well, since you brought up my name, I'm going to chime in. Um, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, I have uh, known Phil Anselmo. He has mentioned me in interviews. I don't want to go into details about my own music, but uh, um, as a on a personal level, I do like the guy. Um, but when it comes to Pantera, I view that as very lowbrow uh, music that they've released. And... Uh, um, I, I honestly view the sweet spot of, of metal being more along the lines of being middle brow. Yes, you can have high brow concepts, but the music itself, I view, should be firmly uh, transfixed in a uh, middle brow type of setting. Um, that's where the the riffs they they make sense, you know, to the the common denominator, if you want to say. But they also communicate something as they go along. Um, and I don't view that Pantera has that. Uh, uh, I view Pantera as being uh, really catering to like the the commercial aspect of music um, where you it's really dumbed down to the lowest common denominator. And it is very lowbrow um, um, in a lot of instances. But there well, are... I don't want to... I don't want to reopen the lowbrow, middlebrow debate again, but I think setting aside Pantera themselves, I think what's interesting about what you're unpacking there is going back to like footage and interviews from the early 90s when death metal was exploding onto MTV and had become way more popular than anyone ever imagined. You do see a lot of interviews saying very similar things about there are too many bands now. Um, everyone's sort of copying the kind of originators. Everyone's copying each other. No one's got their own identity. We need to kind of um, limit <laughs> limit the population in a way to make sure that there's still imagin imagination and quality going on. And I think that's the real sort of tension at the heart of what I'm trying to get at here is like when I, I mean, I'm engaging less with live music at the moment um, just because I've got other stuff going on. Um, but when I do go out into the scene and sort of go to some local gigs or whatever, you really get the sense of community and the sense of like mutual support and all of these bands kind of mucking in and yeah, also maintaining that degree of professionalism in them being very respectful of each other and respectful of the venues and the fans and the audiences really kind of getting into that vibe. But at the same time, there does need to be a degree of, it's not anything goes there still needs to be quality music to back it up and that's not a call for like you know 
really elitist gatekeeping, but it is a call for a degree of like quality control to say if you're not bringing your A game, if you're not bringing something to the table, then you might not get booked for the next gig or whatever. But I think the UK death metal scene, as I as I perceive it these days, it is walking that line. It might tip over in one way or the other at some point, but um, yeah, it is it is finding that balance, and I think it is like cyclical in a way, in that it'll reach a tipping point and go one way or the other. But um, yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, I think there's there's another. So I don't think it's quite as simple as a repetition of what was happening in the sort of early to mid nineties after the death metal explosion. I, I think. Firstly, there is quality out there, and there's yes, actually, no, absolutely, I agree with that. Yeah, not only there is quality, there's a lot of it. There's a, there are actually a lot of. And I don't just mean in terms of the standard of musicianship or the ability to construct songs which aren't necessarily that forward thinking. I mean, I genuinely think that because the means of creative creating um, actual musical work have become more available there are simply more people expressing themselves in that way and there's we're almost in a situation where we have more more creators than audience right and that's mm -hmm. where the real the real kind of tension is in a sense because there's there's just so much noise that that quality is difficult to find you've only got so many minutes per day and it's only so minutes per day that you're able to devote to actually paying attention to to music. So that becomes the, the valuable commodity in a sense. And all of these bands are vying for everyone's attention. And you you have some of the bands that are tech and let's say self promotionally savvy that can get through without necessarily being particularly good and conversely you have bands that are incredible that you just never hear of because they can't be bothered or they just don't have the wherewithal to promote themselves an example of this i don't know if you you know them but um agonist from norwich honestly the uh was it the bad old days um it's one of my favorite albums of the past 20 years and don't be put off by the front cover. The, the artwork is terrible. <laughs> but the, the actual, and this is, uh, 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 Lewis acknowledges this, the main guy. Uh, but honestly, it's both in terms of the themes, the, the kinds of, uh, the t styles of music to bring together, the, just the vocals, it's the voice of the soul. Like really, it's just incredible, the performance. And, the drumming is, I would, you know, it's fantastic drumming, great production. Honestly, it's a gem. It's a hidden gem, and it's, they just didn't play the game. So you never got to hear them, but they're a fantastic band. Well, you should absolutely hear them. Yeah, that, that goes to show because I've, I don't think I've come across Agonist, but that kind of goes to prove your point in a way is like the fact that a band's, they're, they're supposed to be savvy on, self-promotion now via via social media um it's not just enough to have the technical and the creative ability to pull off what you've got you also need to have that degree of self-promotion which isn't just a case of sharing all of your stuff on social media but it, it takes that kind of mental load as well to kind of big up what you're doing which is you know it's taxing in a way i i hate like bigging up whatever I'm doing at a particular time. It just really goes against my nature. But, you know, you kind of, you have to do I that. Think it's a, I think it's a British thing apart from anything else. I True, completely yeah. completely understand that. And it's, it's just grating to have to be that guy, right? Hey, listen to my band. You need, it, it's a lot more powerful also if you have somebody else doing it. But here's the thing. If you're not your own band's biggest fan, then you're wasting your time. Don't bother. Honestly, you have to be a genuine advocate for what you're doing and you have to genu genuinely make something that caters to your own taste like from E to Z. And if it doesn't, then either forget it or 
refine it and work on your craft. But what, what to, to, to your point about spending time doing the other stuff, like I call that the bullshit. And somebody in the band has to deal with it because otherwise the band doesn't go anywhere. And, and, and like you almost, you basically become the de facto band manager because you deal with the bullshit, the, the networking, the, 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 the chasing people up with, with emails, uh, sorting out the artwork, all, all that sort of stuff. If there isn't somebody who does it, nobody else is going to bother. But the bullshit, the more of your time it takes up, the less time you have to, to, to actually devote to music. And that's really, really irritating. I can't tell you. Well, <laughs> you, you, pro- you can probably relate to it, being in, in, uh, involved in music yourself. But uh, yes. No, I, I absolutely can. Um, and yeah it, it's something that i'm i'm often sort of not just in in music but in sort of my own you know music writing as well sort of trying to big that anything you do that kind of you want to push into a public space you have to get to the point where you're comfortable with actually sort of standing by it and yeah shoving it in people's faces which yeah is very very um uncomfortable for some of my nature but um yeah you as you said if you're not your own biggest fan, um, then yeah, forget about it. But I'll just hand over to Jason. I think he's got a question, and then and then we'll uh, wrap up. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're talking about UK metal, and you know we we did have an interruption today because a guy from Gore Rotted, uh, which I haven't heard since like 2005, honestly. But um, surprised that you ran into him because I remember their album Only Tools and Corpses, but I. Um, I have a question uh, about, you know, we're on the topic of UK metal and about a week and a half ago, Danny Filth uh, had done a cameo for Shelly and uh, it was really, really awkward because the what I wrote for the cameo was that uh, Shelly wasn't really a fan of uh, Cradle of Filth. So uh danny filth goes ahead and does a cameo and he's just really really awkward and surreal and it was just bizarre <laughs> and uh what are your thoughts on uh cradle of filth as we're talking about uh uk metal nathaniel so um i um firstly i i don't like to bad mouth uh other artists um i'm i, I would say that they definitely created an aesthetic and I have a lot of respect for that. And they, you know, they, they, there's a reason they exploded in the way that they did. Right. And, and, uh, and again, I, I respect that. But I, I never caught on to it. I never really got into it. There was something about their, their music that, that jarred with me, whether it was the symphonic uh, or the sort of spoken word part just it always felt stilted and contrived to me personally right but again i haven't really given it enough time to give you an authoritative judgment but i'm glad they exist because it's nice to have a band out there that are this almost universal cultural reference because they're so readily identified Right, you, you, they're so successful that they became a cliche. That they that they appeared, that they were mentioned in the IT crowd. Right, <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, that's uh, that's yeah, that that that's what I feel about Cradle in a nutshell. Uh, yeah, but- just for reference, the IT crowd is um, a a comedy show uh, from I think it was the mid two thousands that aired on Channel Four. It was one of the national tv shows just for anyone from america who's listening but um just also for the record cradle of filth was one of my gateway bands so obviously i'm older and wizen now and i've listened to a hell of a lot of extreme metal over the years and i i can place cradle of filth in the kind of uh you know tradition of extreme metal and see where they sit but when you're 12 13 years old and you don't have that knowledge Cradle of Filth was very important to me and for that reason they will always be very important as every metalhead will tell you they have their little handful of bands that got them into metal even if they don't take them seriously anymore but I think more generally it's interesting that 
the UK's two most internationally renowned and biggest exports in black metal are Venom and Cradle of Filth, who are perhaps two of the bands that create the most heated discussion, shall we say, within black metal as well. I kind of I kind of like that that's the UK's biggest stamp on on black metal as a whole. I'm kind of thinking uh, the best way we can end this interview, of course, we'll feature a song by Damon, but uh, why don't we actually post the cameo too, just so people can see what we're referring to with Danny Phil. I mean, we can, but it's it's uncomfortable viewing, man. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's very awkward and surreal, and it's just, you know, it's like when you ask someone to do a cameo, but you tell them that you hate their music, and when you actually feel sorry for them afterward, <laughs> it's just fucking bizarre. But uh, yeah, let's post that. Like, we'll play a song by Damon afterwards, and then we'll post a cameo. <laughs> and that'll be hilarious um, so people can see what we're referring to. But uh, Shelly, I'll let you wrap up today. Uh, well, yeah, um, all I will say is um, it's been absolutely amazing chatting to you, Nathaniel, and I could have gone on for several more hours chatting about um, extreme metal and the scene in general. But uh, thank you very much for uh, for coming on. Thanks very much for having me. I would add uh, if uh, or rather when we happen to bump into each other, if the uh, circumstances are auspicious and a pub is involved, then I'd be happy to continue and give you those a uh, couple of extra hours of the podcast uh, without the audience. So, uh, so yes, thanks again for having me and giving uh, us the opportunity to uh, promote our music and just giving me the opportunity to talk nonsense at you for, for, for n over an hour. Um, <laughs> and yes. Yes. Let's hope a pub is involved next time. I'll be sure to introduce myself next time you guys uh, out on tour. And um Jason, thank you very much for joining, as always, your own podcast. Yeah, thank you for taking the reins today. Had fun. Yeah, it's been awesome. And uh, Damim's latest EP, World Turned Hell, uh, will be out on the 1st of June. And also check out the bloodied comic book, comic book that we discussed earlier on. And um, their album, A Fine Game of Nil, uh, released back in 2019. Also check that out. And um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, listening. Have a good day. Set
Greetings there, Shelley. How the devil are you? This is Danny Filth, unfortunately for you. Danny Filth from Cradle of Filth. And I am here at the behest of one lone goat, your uh, co-host at the Necropolis Extreme Metal Podcast. But you know that because uh, he's your co-host. But anyway, you, my friend, you're the subject of a cameo video request. And uh, yes, unfortunately for you, it appears to be me. Um, because Lone Goat says what's special about you that you want me to know. Uh, you live in Leeds and you love black metal. You even have a blog, blah, 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 a blog on it called Hate Meditations and you hate Cradle of Filth. Well, wow. Then this is probably um, a fucking delight for you then, isn't it? Uh, what a present. I do apologise. I didn't mean to be here. Um, I was just requested. So anywho, disappointment aside, you think Cradle of Filth is creepy pasta and Iron Maiden. Creepy pasta, that's cool. Um, anywho, this is uh, congratulations uh, for you from Lone Goat because you're soon to be a father. Congratulations, mate. I do hope you already knew that and I didn't just blow it for you, uh, the information that is. Um, anywho, congratulations, mate. Very, very chuffed you. And believe it or not, despite sounding like Iron Maiden, I would be very interested in hearing your Necropolis Extreme Metal podcast. Well, anywho, say hello to a lone goat for me. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, uh, rather sordid opportunity. Apologise for the disappointment, mate. Take care, stay safe, but above all else, regardless of flavour, stay filthy! Your fiend, Danny Filth. All the best. Goodbye.